number is 222 in our hand book. 222.
Amen. Well, welcome again to Tri-State Baptist Temple tonight. We look forward to another good uh, night tonight. We're looking forward to Bible school starting tomorrow evening, and uh, we'll do some uh, work tonight to get ready for that, get some things decorated and things ready to go. So we're just looking forward to a good week, uh, but we're looking forward to tonight as well, just spending time uh, in God's Word in just a a few moments. Uh, But we do want to remind you about Bible school. Be praying about that. Also want to remind our joy group, we're going to have a trip on Tuesday uh, this week and uh, leave here about 10.30 in the morning and go to, down to Wheelersburg uh, to Fred's Pizza and have uh, some fellowship there, have a lunch together. And so hope if you're, a part of our, if you're in our joy group, you'll make plans for that and come and be a part of that, uh, that trip. So we're looking forward to that and uh, we're just excited about uh, the week that we have, being able to have all the children here and uh, just spending time teaching them the Word of God, presenting the Gospel, and uh, we want to see the Lord work this week. Uh, But uh, at this time, we'll have our men come. We'll take up our tithes, offering, and faith promise this evening. All right, let's pray. Yes. Amen. Thank you, Bailey. That was good. Appreciate the good offertory. And on Sunday night now, we always take up our change offerings. So if you have some pocket change that you can uh, use to give in the offering tonight, we'll put that right in our our jug and keep that and keep working on camp again for next summer. Now it's only, you know, less than a year away. So uh, it'll be here again before you know it. But uh, we are excited about uh, our uh, summer programs, our camp. It's a good way to start off the summer. Bible school is a good way to kind of finish it off. And then uh, coming up right after that, back to school. And uh, so it's hardy time to start thinking about that. Uh, you go in Walmart now and the whole front of the store is all back to school stuff, isn't it? And uh, it's hard to believe. But uh, we all want to uh, just take up that offering tonight. So we need some of you boys and girls in here to come and help me out going to be a big job for a few of you. Come on and give me a hand. We're going to pray together and we'll let you go ahead and take our offering up today. Let's just pray. Father, thank you for being good to us. Thank you for the uh, grace and goodness of God. Thank you for the day that we've enjoyed and all the people that were here this morning that were able to be ministered to through your word. We just pray it will have an internal effect on their lives. Well, we pray tonight. Now, you bless the offering. Thank you for these boys and girls. And, Lord, keep your hand on them. And, Lord, we just want to continue to see them grow in the Lord. And, Lord, just become, uh, God, uh, young men and women of God with a heart to live for you and to serve you. 
And Lord, we pray we'll just uh, continue to faithfully uh, lead the way. And Lord, we just ask you to bless the offering in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, if you have some offering, hold your hand up. They're going to come by and pick it up. Thank our boys and girls for helping us take our offering up tonight. Uh, before our pastor comes, the Lively Stone Youth Group is going to come and sing a special. So you come right ahead. The youth group's going to teach you guys a couple of courses that we've been learning over in the youth group. Uh, so we're going to sing it through once, and then we want you guys to sing with us the second time, okay? It's on the first page of your hymnal. <laughs> Drew was supposed to be doing this, but I don't know where, why he's still back there. <laughs> <laughs> with it on this time. one right on the same page there. sing uh, the next the next song there you can just follow along with us
thank you. I enjoyed that. I like that. Love those choruses, and we want to keep working on those and sing those again. Love the one by Dr. John R. Rice, and I uh, like to uh, read through that and just listen to those simple little words that he had there. Peace the world cannot know, safe wherever I go. Uh, he's the man I've told you several times. He's, he was a great preacher in the 1940s, 1950s. Didn't care to preach about sin. And in Texas, preaching in a tent meeting, a big open tent meeting, preaching about how people ought not to drink and live together and commit adultery and sin. And some old drunken, wicked man came up after the service one night, pulled out a pistol and actually stuck it up in the stomach of Dr. Rice and said, Dr. Rice, I'm going to kill you. I'm going to shoot you. Dr. Rice said, you can't threaten me with heaven. <laughs> you can't threaten me with heaven. He was safe wherever he went, wasn't he? Because he was in the hands of the Lord. And uh, so what a great song. I, I appreciate the hymn that they, that they sang. That's why I encourage you. Use your hymn book as a devotion book. You can go out and spend $35 on a devotion book by somebody you don't know who they are, where they're coming from, or what they believe, and try to get close to God. All you have to do is get your hymn book out. You read through that hymn right there. That'll give you something to worship God about. And uh, such a tremendous song they sang. And I know it's something we don't sing very often, but just a blessing. I, I'm thankful that they ministered to us tonight that way. Just a blessing. Good to see everyone. Don't forget we will do some work for Bible school. And if you're a Bible school teacher or you're helping in a, in a Bible school class, uh, right here on the back two pews of the wing here, uh, we have a large uh, poster of the dog that's kind of the, uh, he's the poster dog of Bible school. He's the main character, tracker, and uh, you can have that. And then along with that poster, there are three or four different kinds of graphics that we have printed out for you. And you can take those and use those materials in your classroom. So don't forget to get a stack of that stuff tonight for each of our classes. And you can use it along with whatever else that you have uh, to, to begin to decorate with tonight. And then don't forget as well, right after the service, we want to invite everybody here to join us for a little fellowship. We're going to celebrate Evan's birthday and uh, in the ministry center. Got some refreshments and some things over there. And a uh, year older and a uh, year wiser, right? And uh, 25, I believe, 25 years old. And your brother, is he the same age now? Okay. All right. And uh, so... Uh, we want to just enjoy that with him and his family tonight right after the service. Well, it's been a great day. We had a good day this morning, had folks visiting, and a uh, great opportunity to minister to families and people today, and we're excited about what the Lord is doing, and we hope you will be as well, and just pray, and uh, you know, this is, a, this is a tremendous warfare we're in, isn't it? And uh, we're looking at that, what Satan is doing in the world. I'd like for you to take your Bible tonight and open them again to the New Testament, this time to the book of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2. I'm going to read beginning in verse 14, 2 Timothy chapter 2. And I'm going to read some verses here for you. Tonight's message is going to be the snares of the devil, the snares of the devil. This morning we saw that the devil's at work. He's been at work from the beginning. He was a sinner from the beginning. He sinned in the beginning. He brought that rebellious, prideful, sinful spirit into this world. When he came into this world, he tempted Adam and Eve with it. And through his workings and through the willingness of man to sin, he thought he destroyed everything God wanted, and that was to have an eternal relationship with man. What a great work he did. I'm thankful that on the cross of Calvary, the Lord Jesus smashed the devil's work. He destroyed it and made a show of the devil and, and defeated him when he arose from the grave so that now the devil's work can be destroyed and it can be undone in our hearts and in our lives. But I want you to look with me tonight at the snares of the devil. 2 Timothy 2, let's read beginning in verse 14. Of these things, put them in remembrance charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, but shun profane and vain babblings. They will increase unto more ungodliness." 
and their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom is Hymenius and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already, and overthrow the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are His. Let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, some to honor, some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Flee also youthful lusts, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strives. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. If you'll notice that last verse, verse 26, you'll see that phrase, the snare of the devil. And that's what we want to talk about for a little while tonight. Father, we thank you for the good day you've allowed us to have. Thank you for the services this morning, our Sunday school hour. Lord, thank you that we had folks visiting our church, moms bringing their children and Lord, we just pray that we'll be able to reach them and encourage them and help them, God, and help them to build their life on the sure foundation of Your Word. And Lord, uh, that we might be a church family together that will help strengthen them. Lord, we pray together tonight now that You'll bless this time. And Lord, as we've opened up our Bibles, let us open up our hearts. And the truth that You have for us, help us to receive it, Lord, with thanksgiving, God, even though sometimes it's hard as it reveals to us the need of our life, but may we run to you, flee to you, that you might do what you want to do in our lives. Lord, we want to be vessels that bring you honor and glory. Lord, help us not to be entangled in the snares of the devil, but God, give us wisdom, and, and Lord, help us and lead us and guide us. Now, Lord, uh, we're just asking tonight now that you administer to us, and Lord, we just want to be obedient people to you. We want to be people of faith. And God, through the Word of God, we see faith grow and strengthened as we obey Your Word. So Lord, help us to be obedient. Lord, we just ask now again, You'd just be magnified, lifted up. Lord, help us to see You're the victor, and we can have victory, victory in our life through You. And uh, tonight, God, now again, we just commit this time to You. We ask You to work and do what You will. In Jesus' name, Amen. We said this morning we have a supernatural enemy, supernatural enemy, and because of that, we need the supernatural work of God in our lives if we're going to be able to defeat that enemy. We need the work of the Holy Spirit of God in our life. We need His work. We need the work of the Word of God in our life. And we need it on a daily basis. We need it daily. In the context of this passage of Scripture, we read about the devil's snares. The devil's snares. And you know, we may think of this as only applied to the life of the unsaved, but that's not true. The devil's snares are for the saved as well. If you want to hold your place right there, but turn back just a few pages, and you'll see something that's amazing in chapter 3 of 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy 3, beginning in verse 1, what we're finding here is God is giving to His church the qualifications of that individual man who might be a pastor, an elder, a bishop, a pastor, or a deacon in the church, as you read on a little further. Look at what it says. It says, this is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach not given to wine, no striker, not greedy of filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, one that ruleth well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. For if a man not, uh, know not how to rule his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Not a novice, 
Look at verse 7. Lest being lifted up with pride, he fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must have a good report of them that are without, lest he fall into reproach and the snare of the devil. Savior. He's writing in 1 Timothy 3, you men of God, you men that will be preachers and pastors, you've got to be on your guard because the devil wants to ensnare you. And if that's true about the man of God, it's going to be true about the people of God. The snare of the devil. The devil uses his snares on all men. And a snare is a trap. It's been built with purpose. A snare a snare is used by a huntsman. A snare is, is set and devised with cunning and experience. It's unseen. It's unexpected. It entraps. It entangles. It tightens. It constricts the one into whom has fallen this snare. We know the lost are already entrapped in the snare of sin. The snare of sin has condemned them to hell for eternity. And Satan wants to keep them there. And if it hadn't been for the Lord getting the victory and destroying the works of the devil, no man would have hope of ever getting out of that snare. But I'm thankful that the Lord Jesus won the victory. He destroyed the works of the devil so that now we can be delivered from that and have eternal life. But the devil seeks to ensnare the saved as well as the lost. He wants to keep the saved. He wants to ruin our lives. He wants to render our lives unusable and useless to God for the glory of God and for the work of God. He wants to ruin us. He wants to make our lives so that they'll have no impact in eternity in the work of God. Snares are not always those of sin and disqualification. We think about the snare that the devil might set for the saved. It's not always some gross sin that we fall into. Sometimes maybe the devil's most most powerful snare is that he allows God's people to be successful in things that are not sinful but they are not eternal one of the great snares of the devil is he just lets God's people be successful in worldly things lets them succeed why so that they become so consumed with these worldly things and the success that they have gained that those things take the place that God should have in their lives and they'll live their lives for the temporal and the worldly and not the eternal and that's just as much a snare as some great sin that they might have committed the devil snares you can hold your place there but back in Ephesians chapter 20 we we've already seen in this thought of the devil and his work in this world what a warm place the church in Ephesus had in the life of the Apostle Paul it's one of his favorite places and if you look back in Acts chapter 20 Paul was preparing to leave the church at Ephesus and continue on in his journeys but he warns them before he leaves about what he knows the devil will try to do when he leaves in verse number 28 of Acts chapter 20 Paul says to them, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. Paul's warning them, I'm leaving. I've been your shepherd. And I've been doing what a shepherd does. I've taken the rod and I've been driving away the wolves. And I've been keeping them at bay. But when I leave, the wolves are going to come. 
They're going to come in and they're going to try to destroy this flock and tear them apart and prey on the weak. And, and not, only, not only does he say that they're going to be the wolves come from outside, but they'll arise in some from within that are going to try to divide the flock. I tell you what you ought to do. You ought to beware of anybody that wants you to draw a line and stand against the preacher. Stand against the man of God who wants to divide the body of Christ into those that are for this and those that are against that because that's not of God in any way. God's not the author of dividing things. God's the author of building things. And when there are matters of differences of opinion, we find that in the scripture. There were some differences in the life of Peter, the differences in the life of Paul. These men worked through those things with no harm to the local church. But when someone doesn't care to tear up and divide and destroy the church from within, those things are not of God. And Paul warns them, when, when I leave, these things are going to happen. They're going to happen. They're going to, they're going to come in here. And, and not only do we have to worry about the outside enemy, but there's always an inside enemy. And you know, in our own lives, if we think that that is not true for us, if we think that we don't have anything to worry about, there's no danger for our lives to be ensnared by the devil. If, if we feel like that this supernatural warfare is really not a reality for us, then you're already in the devil's snare and you don't even realize it. We all need to realize that at all times the devil, our adversary, he's either trying to ensnare you or he already has you tripped up. One or the other. And he is unceasing, unrelenting in his desire to ensnare us. In this passage back in 2 Timothy chapter 2, the preacher's instructing the preacher. Paul's telling Timothy to preach on this subject. The snares of the devil. Of these things, put them in remembrance. Charge them before the Lord that they that they remember that there's a devil who wants to ensnare them. And when the devil is preached about, he doesn't like it. And he'll stir things up, try to get you stirred up in your heart and mind so you're not heeding, not listening to the Word of God. And, and we're to bring these truths, he says, to the forefront. Remind God's people what, what you already know, but that sometimes we let these truths slip. Sometimes we do not guard our lives against these things. We don't live circumspectly anymore. And God said we've got to remind ourselves of these truths. Let's look at these things. I want you to notice as we just go down through this passage of Scripture, I'm just going to walk right through this just like we would in a Bible study, okay? We need to study the Word of God. He says in, in the 14th verse, I want you to notice, first of all, he talks about the snare of our words, the snare of our words. He says, he says there, of these things put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord, that they strive not about words to no profit. No, no profit to these words. Instead, they subvert the people who hear them. This is a snare that he's warning us about. What's he saying? Not striving uh, with words to those words that have no profit. Those words that will subvert the hearers. The word subvert means to turn upside down. The word subvert means to overthrow. And, and we find that what he's talking about here, he's talking about all the things we say, all the conversations that we have that, that are things that we need not say and conversations we need not have. How much time do we spend saying things that we don't need to say, talking about things we don't need to talk about? There's no profit in them. No profit in them. And when he's talking about profiting, he's talking about in the sense of spiritually edifying, strengthening the people, the people that we're talking to, strengthening uh, and encouraging others to live for God and the glory of God. Don't forget what he said there to the church in Ephesus in chapter 4 in verse number 29. He said, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying 
that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. But let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven you. He's saying don't fall into the snare of idle words. Saying things that you need not say that aren't profitable to anybody. These words that we say and use do not profit. We say them, but they have no profit. Instead, they're like snares that the devil uses to turn people's lives upside down. Instead, these conversations sometimes we have, they'll literally turn people away from the Lord, away from the Word of God, away from the church. Instead of, instead of encouraging them and strengthening them and leading them into the Lord. The snare of our words. He talks in verse number 15 how we have to be care that our words are not a snare. But instead we need to study the word of God. Study. Show thyself approved unto God. Study the word of God. We need to find out what God's word says. Stay in the word of God and line our life up to what the word of God is teaching us. And if we'll do that, then we're not going to be in danger of falling into some of these snares. And God's word and in God's way, we can stay out of the devil's snares. So many times we talk about things we, we don't even understand. We don't have all the facts. We don't, we don't know everything that there is to know. And yet we talk about it anyway. And without knowing all the facts, there's no use to even talk about it. Because it's only going to do more harm than good. Verse number 16, he talks about how we should shun profane things and vain babblings, conversations and prattling on and on about things that really mean nothing. And uh, he talks about shunning them. To shun something means either shut it out or shut it up. That's what he's talking about. In other words, don't be the source of those that are prattling on about things that are empty and things you don't really know about and you don't have all the facts about. And, uh, and be sure that you're not the one listening to those that are doing that. Shun those things. Either shut them off or shut them in. But, but avoid them. These things that are profane. What does that mean? Well, the word profane, it means to, to be against God in the, in the sense that it's unrighteous. It's things that, that we wouldn't have a conversation with God about. They're profane. And yet, and yet we do. Even though we know... If we believe the Bible, the Holy Spirit of God lives in us. He's with us. Everywhere we go, hearing every word we say, every conversation that we say. You know, there's a principle. There's a principle that nothing stays the same. Nothing stays the same. Our words, if they're the right words, can help good things get better. But our words, if they're the wrong words, they can help bad things get worse. But they will not they will not have zero effect because nothing stays the same. They either build up and edify or they turn away and they tear down and they can be a snare. They can be a snare. Now, uh, verse 17, he talks about them. He said, their words will eat as doth a canker. We don't use that word anymore. That word, we would more, we would more associate that word with a tumor or a cancer inside growing from the inside and eating and destroying those things and he says that that our words sometimes are like a cancer within our lives eating away at us from within and you know what happens as is people get ideas in their heads and hearts from what they hear and what has been said i know people today who have been turned away from the lord the lord's work and they're shipwrecked in their life today because they listen to people prattle on with vain babblings, saying things that they didn't know the whole, uh, the whole uh, realm of the information they needed to say. And yet people listened to these people and it affected their hearts and lives and turned them away from God. And it affected uh, families. It divides families and churches all because these people let those words get in their heart and mind. And like a canker, a cancer, it just ate away at them from the inside. They start thinking of things that aren't right. They start allowing ideas to get established and get rooted into their lives that are not right. 
things that are not biblical, things that are not scriptural, not true, and they live their lives by these things. Oh, how many times, how many times I've had I've had to deal with people, I've had to deal with people who who let this get started in their life, and only they let it go so long there was just no way to cure it. And I, and I, all you can do is just say, I wish you would have come to me. I wish you would have come to me. Because there's some things you don't know. And because of what you don't know and what you listen to other people, you allowed this to eat away at you to where now there's no way we can reconcile this. And, and, and our words are such a snare. They're such a snare. We thought that this was going to be all about the problems we might fall into. But I want you to know, the devil can use us as snares for others if we're not careful. If we're not careful, instead of growing stronger sometimes and more Christ-like, people through our words grow weaker and more susceptible to the snares. Paul named some of the men right here in, 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 their, uh, in their church who let this happen, this Hymenius and this Philetus. They listened to this thing and got trapped up in the snare of these words to the point where, where uh, their actions and their, their activity within the body of Christ, it overthrew the faith of some. It overthrew the faith of some of those weaker, younger Christians and people in that local church. And, and it says that they were unsound in the faith. Their faith over, was overthrown. Truth and doctrine was replaced with error and unscriptural ideas, and it led some people away from God and the Word of God. I tell you what, our lives being right with God matters. It matters whether or not your life is right with God. It matters. It matters. Our lives being right with God and being lived for God in the right way make a difference. We're dealing with eternal things. And, and, uh, and as, as, as our lives impact and influence the lives of others, we're either doing something in the right way for God and for eternity or we're doing harm in the wrong way for those that we have influence on. And the devil is at work. And I tell you, he's not playing games. The devil isn't playing around at what he's doing in this world. He's a murderer. He's a destroyer. And I'll tell you, we can't play around at being a child of God in the world. It's not a game we can just play around with and do it when it suits us because our lives are affecting the lives of other people. You parents, your lives are affecting your children in ways you may never realize how it's affecting them until later on down the road when you sit back and you're stunned at the course of their life. You wonder, how did they wind up where they are? Because we play in games at being a child of God, playing games with our life, being right with God, playing games by being not only ensnared by the devil, but being used by the devil as a snare. The devil doesn't play games, and our lives are too important. They matter. Verse 19, he talks about the sure foundation the sure foundation of God's word. God has given us a fixed point of reference in our lives of right and truth. It's his word. His word. We must line our lives up with his word every day. We need to study it. Get right with it. He says, depart iniquity. If you're a child of God, depart iniquity. Get sin out of your life. Get iniquity out of your life. Uh, be real. Be genuine in your devotion to the Lord. Because you're not fooling God. And I tell you what, for somebody that's right with God, you're not fooling them either. You think We think we can get away with that. Listen, you can sense when there's something not right in a person's life if we're right with God. We can tell that. And God knows it. And I tell you what, you know who you are and you know God knows who you are. And we need to be right and real so that God can can keep our lives from the snares of the devil and so that we will not be one for others. The snares of the devil. Let me give you this second thought, the sincere desire of our works. And we're just going right down through this passage of Scripture. And we move from where he talks about the snare of our words to where he begins in verse number 20, talking about the, the sincere desire of the work of our life. He says in that 20th verse, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, 
and some to honor and some to dishonor. What's he talking about? I believe he's talking about the church in a great house. We're talking about the house of God, the church of the living God, the local New Testament assembly. And in that house of God, I believe in that house, there are many vessels and types of vessels. This is representing the lives of the people of God. And the reality is that some of our lives are for the honor of God and some of our lives are to the dishonor of God. God's saying that's the reality of it. He said some of them, some of our lives are like Job. Remember what Job says in Job 23.10? But he knoweth the way that I take. And when he hath tried me, what's he say? I shall come forth like gold. When he purifies me, when he gets out of my life the things he needs to get out through the trials that I'm going through, I'm going to come out a vessel of honor, of gold that he can use for the glory of God. There's some of us, some of you, that are, your lives are that way. God's put you through the fires and trying your life. You come forth as gold and God uses your life. In reality, in some lives, there's that work of purifying and, and they've come forth by responding to those trials in faith and their gold for God in the world. Some lives are pure and sincere and valuable and God does His work in and through those lives in this world. Reality is some of God's people's lives are like gold, some are like silver, but on the other hand, some are like wood and earth. Some are like wood and earth. And by, by the choices that we make, and by what we are allowing God to make out of our lives, we determine what kind of vessel we are for God. Verse number 21, he says, If a man therefore purge himself from, from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, meet for the master's use, prepared unto every good work. And you know what? This ought to be the sincere desire of the heart and life of every child of God. This is what we ought to want for our life. This is what we ought to want, the summation of the work in our life for this world, for God to be, that we're prepared, fit for the master's use unto whatever work he desires for, to use our life for. A vessel of honor. That ought to be what we desire with all of our heart and life. I wonder, is it what you desire above all things, that you're a vessel of honor at all times, fit for the master's use, ready for every good work that God might call you or lead you to because there's a great door of opportunity before us in our lives? Or, or is our desire above this for some worldly momentary thing? Are we living right now with the reality in our heart and mind that someday... We're going to stand before the Lord as our Creator and as our Savior. And what is it that comes to mind right now, if we'll be honest? If you'll be honest, you know, there's this, this warfare begins when the Word of God is opened and taught and preached. Now, now, what is it? it, 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 it what is it that comes to mind right now that you know that God isn't pleased with in your life? You don't, even have to, you don't even have to search very far. You already know what it is. You know what it is. God's not pleased with that. It's in your life, but it's marring your vessel. Instead of being gold or silver, you're, you're earth or wood. And there's some things there that God can't use your life for because your life is marred by some things you've allowed into your heart and life. What is it right now? And this is where the warfare comes into play. What, what, what are you going to do about what God lays on your heart? You're going to do something about it or are you just going to let it go? Because that's what the devil wants you to do. He just wants you to let it go. Just keep on going on being that kind of vessel. I tell you, our pride will ensnare us. It will be used against us. It will keep us ensnared because we'll not allow the Lord to clean up our life and make it right so that the work of our life can be sincere and glorify God. We're talking about, we're talking about the snares that the devil has. We're talking about how this should be the sincere desire of our heart that we be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, meet for the master's use, prepared for every good work. That would be the desire of our heart. Let me give you just this last thought. The way out of the snares of the devil. 
moving right through that passage when we come to verse 22. He talks, starts talking about the way out of these snares. How to get out of them if we're in them. How to avoid them and miss them. He says in verse 22, flee also youthful lusts, but follow, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Flee lust, youthful lust. I tell you now, there are some things that will always tempt you. They'll always tempt you. They did in your youth, and they'll keep tempting you as you grow older, and they'll tempt you as long as you live in this flesh. I used to think about that passage I just read, the 22nd verse, and I thought like, well, this is just applying to young people. When you're young, you got to be careful. But I don't believe that's what this means at all. I believe it means whether I'm 20 or whether I'm 80, there are things that tempted me in my youth that are still going to tempt me today. They're the lust of the youth, but they'll continue to tempt me till I leave this world. And I have victory ultimately from the presence of sin, being brought into the presence of the Savior. But we have to flee these things. We'll never get too old to be tempted and ensnared by some things. We'll never be too mature or too strong in this world to, that these things will no longer affect us. They're always going to affect us. As long as there's blood pumping through our physical, fleshly, sinful bodies, there's some things that will always, always tempt us. We have to flee them. Remember, Paul is preaching to the preacher. He's preaching to the preacher about these things. Flee youthful lusts. I tell you what, there's never a day where you don't go to war with the devil and the world and the flesh to where you don't have to discipline your life to yield it to the Holy Spirit. And you've got to realize this decision I'm about to make that my flesh wants me to make, what's that going to do? For the glory of God. How's that going to affect this vessel? Will it make it a vessel of honor? Or will it dishonor it and mar it? And make it unqualified for some of the work that the master would have me to do? There's not a day goes by that we don't have to make that choice and decision. Every day throughout that day. As the devil sets his snares in our life. We've got to be disciplined. We've got to die to self and live under the Holy Spirit that lives in our life. Paul's preaching to a preacher. He's preaching to me, and he's sharing that for all of God's people. Flee. That has to do with our direction, doesn't it? It has to do with direction. Here it is. Turn around and get away from it. Flee it. It's talking about our direction. It's talking about our actions. It's talking about taking action to get away from those things we know that will ensnare us. Notice what he says there, flee also youthful lust, but follow. You ought to circle the word flee and circle the word follow and draw a line and connect them too. Because there's two actions that's necessary here. It's not enough just to flee, you got to follow. you got to flee those things that tempt you, those lusts of the flesh, and you got to follow something. And he tells us what we ought to follow. Follow righteousness, follow faith, follow charity, follow peace. Because these things will lead us away from the snares. Following those things will help you flee the snares. And notice, notice what he says. I want you to mark also with them. That seems like those are very simple little words. He says flee youthful lusts. But follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace with them. See? See this is the thing. that This is, this is where a local church is so important. For your spiritual well-being. Yeah. I tell you what you want to do when you're snared up by the devil and you're yielding to the lusts of your flesh, you start isolating yourself from the people of God. You start cutting yourself off from them because they're going in a completely different way than you are. I worry about young people. I watch young people. If they won't interact, be involved, want to be a part of that good core group that are wanting to follow God, wanting to do right, wanting to make their life make a difference for God, and yet they always kind of hanging off, kind of isolated, won't get a part of the group, don't want to be a part of them. That concerns me because they're isolating themselves off 
and they're going to be praying for the snares of the devil. You've got to follow those that are following God. But you've got to make that choice. You've got to make that choice. And you people, you people, you young people, you ought to be sure you're never isolating anyone. But you're looking for people you can encourage and help and, and, and by your heart and life, encourage their heart and life. Be with those who are following and fleeing. Stay near them and follow with them. Don't isolate yourself from the followers of the Lord. It's a snare to do that, to cut yourself off from those who are sincerely seeking to follow the Lord because the devil will cut you off and ensnare you. Follow those who want to follow the Lord and flee everybody else. If they're not interested in following God, you don't have any business following them. Verse number 23. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing they do gender strife. He's talking about now the snares of strife. So many people who feel and follow that which doesn't mean anything in the light of eternity. They fill their lives with things that don't mean anything and won't mean anything a million years from now. And they follow it. They get, they get consumed with it. There's always some little trivial issue that sidetracks people and shuts them down in their tracks from moving forward in, the, in their life for God. It's a, it's a continual fight. There's some issue of their feelings. They get hung up on some feeling that gets them all hung up and their feelings get hurt about this, that, and the other. And, uh, you know, they're upset. Their flesh doesn't feel appreciated. It doesn't feel needed. It isn't wanted. You know, whatever it is, whatever, some little snare the devil can throw out there and hook in our flesh or hook into our feelings. And it gets us all, all, all sidetracked and held up and trapped up. You know, uh, it just consumes people. People get so bent out of shape over things that a million years from now aren't even going to register that they ever were ever of any significance. I'll tell you, I, I'm honest with you, and sometimes you pray for me. I, I, sometimes I want to tell people, I want to shake, I just want to grab people and say, don't you know that we're trying to, trying to serve God here? Don't you know we're trying to fight the devil off here? Don't you know that we're trying to pull souls out of the flames of hell around here and you're hung up on something that doesn't mean anything? Sorry. <laughs> Sometimes I let that go through my mind. With all the little things, that, the little strides that we, that we kind of like to feed. We like to feed them. These are snares. We get all tightened up about things that have no place in our heart or let alone in our thoughts. And strife is a great snare of the devil. He always wants to stir up some strife. And if you're not careful, he'll use you. I don't like to profile people. But I tell you, there's always some pot stirrers. They're never content for things just to be, be, be running smooth. They, they want to stir it up. They want to go to this one and say this, or text this one and say that, or whatever it is, so they can keep something stirred up. Young people sometimes are bad about that. You know, they like to let something slip out that they'll hope some other young person hears because they can get a little jab in at them. But sometimes we adults, we're the same way. We'll open up some conversations and prattle on about some vain things that doesn't have any reality or sense of need and and we do it just so we hope it will stir up a little something. The devil uses the snare of strife. He uses it from within to get some issue to stir up people against one another and get God's people to lose sight of what's happening. That's what he wants to do. Anytime he can create turmoil or trouble in your life or in a church, all he's doing is blowing smoke so that we lose sight of the reality of what's going on. There are people... There are people that need to hear the gospel. There's a real adversary who's ensnaring people through strife. And it encompasses people. It consumes people. I am amazed sometimes when the devil ensnares people in a church with some issue. How they allow it to consume their life. I wonder where do they get the time 
to sit around and think about this. <laughs> Where do they get the time to spend that much time on the phone to make this visit to that person and that person and gender this strife and stir it up? Well, how can they let that consume their life that much? I, I can't even get done the things I need to do today, let alone be around stirring up something like that. But it consumes people, doesn't it? And the devil snares people. And what happens is people get too consumed to pray. And they get too, too consumed to seek God's way about that thing. And all they want then is their way. They get too consumed to study God's word to see if God's already said something about this. Is there, is there already some clear leading about this matter? They get too consumed to realize that we need to be spirit-filled, spirit-led people being sure that we're not ensnared by the devil and that God, uh, that we never allow the devil to use us to gender strife or to destroy God's work and sidetrack God's work. They get too consumed with it. Verse 24, and the servant of the Lord must not strive. He must not strive, but be, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, be patient. God's people are not to be out seeking these things out. We're to flee from them. We're to avoid them. We're to follow the Lord. Verse 25 says, In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. I hate to see that. Because most times, the people that get ensnared, who are used to gender strife and divide and cause dissension, you know, ultimately, they're hurting themselves more than they are anything else. And it's them that down the road are sitting sidetracked up out of church and laid up somewhere, shipwrecked. Or in some church where they've walked away from a, a good Bible preaching local church that can help their family. And all they've done is hurt themselves. They've opposed themselves, ultimately. And it's sad they've hurt and brought grief to themselves and their loved ones. Verse number 25 says there that, you know, in meekness, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, I'm thankful God works. He works to destroy what the devil works to do. And the snares of the devil, God wants to set people free from them. He wants to get them out of those snares. He wants to get them un, unentangled from these things. And he can and he will. But we must acknowledge God's word and work and repent of those things that got us where we are. Repentance. Repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. We've got to agree with God about these things. In verse 26 and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him. I hate that last little bit, at his will. I don't want to be, I want to be a child of God so weak and anemic in my Christian life that just whenever a whim of the devil hits him, he just ensnares me, just plays with my life and toys around with me like I'm some amusement to the devil. I don't want to be that way. There are a lot of people that are that way. But God doesn't want us to be that way. And we can have victory over him as we draw close to him and follow him. And he'll lead us away from these snares. And thankfully told Peter, Peter, I'm praying for you. The devil wants you. And he's going he's gonna to sift you. But when you're converted, you're going to strengthen the brethren. We're going to go through some snares, but I'm thankful God can break us free from them and he can make us better through them and he can use us to strengthen the lives of others. I'm thankful he's a God that's able to do that. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name for your grace and your goodness. We thank you for the word of God. Help us, God, as we digest this truth about the snares of the devil. God, we pray our heart's desire will be that our lives will be God, vessels that are fit for the use of being a child of God, that, Lord, are vessels of honor, sanctified, set apart for your use. And, Lord, whatever it is that you have as an opportunity for us, we want to be prepared to be used by you for that opportunity. Help us, Lord. Keep us from the snares of the devil. God, don't allow us to let him get the advantage to where 
He uses us as a snare. And God, we're asking you today to speak to every heart in life. And God, what you're saying to us right now, those things in our life that are marring our vessel, keeping us, God, as a vessel that is not profitable to you, God, may you deal with us about these things. May we as God's people, God, may we depart from iniquity. May we flee lusts and follow after those things that are righteous and filled with faith and holy and that are, God, filled with your love. And in following these things, God, we can flee the snares of the devil. Set us free from these things. Help us to acknowledge the truth, God, as you reveal it in our hearts and lives. Help us, God, to seek you to set us free and help us be obedient, God, so that when you instruct us how to be delivered, we'll obey and follow you into freedom and into liberty to serve you and live for you so that our lives will make a difference. God, maybe somebody's come to church tonight, but they've never received Christ as their Savior. We pray tonight they'll come and let us take the Word of God and show them how they can be delivered and know you as their Savior. Pray for all our people, all of God's people. Lord, you'd help us to walk circumspectly and be on guard and be wary and be sober of our adversary. God, help us to avoid the snares and deliver us from them. And may we be obedient to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We'll stand and turn to hymn 304. We'll sing a verse of that together. Hymn number 304. I don't know the need in your heart. We just encourage you to be obedient to the Lord and I know you'll never regret that but let's sing together on the first verse and you just respond to him as the Lord leads you to verse 1 of him 304 <clears throat> Second verse, verse two. stop right there don't forget we're going to have a fellowship now right in the ministry center for Evan and recognition of his birthday and uh, good to have his mom and dad here tonight and uh, Elaine is there anything you could tell us about his birth that's significant that you really remember or any? <laughs> all right he, he he was born first okay all right that's good how about as babies, is, was there differences in he and his brother? Or any? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> well, we're we're thankful, thankful for 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 Evan, what he means to our local church and the work the Lord uses him to do. His heart that he desires to serve God, live for the Lord, and uh, uh, we're thankful for that. And. Uh, you need a lot more young men with that desire. Just put their life in God's hands, not worry about what the world has and what the world can give, but just be concerned about what God wants to do, what God's doing in the world. So we're thankful for him. We're going to pray together. We're going to ask the blessing on the refreshments now, but we want Evan and his parents to go on through, get uh, some refreshments and things, and we'll just fellowship a little bit, and then those of you that are going to help with Bible school and can stand help us, we'll get some work done around here and uh, get out of here. But let's pray together and just look to the Lord. Father, we are thankful today for your goodness and your grace. Thanks again, God, for the time we can spend in your word. Lord, as we join together in a local church, we 
pray we'll have a hunger, God, that you teach us and that you lead and guide us through your word. God, help us, God, as God's people to receive your word. Lord, to receive its instruction, its reproof, its correction. Lord, it leads and guides us and furnishes to God uh, to the good work that you saved us to. Help us to apply your word to our life. Don't let the devil get the victory. Don't let him steal away the word of God from our hearts. But God, may we act on it by faithful obedience. God, may we grow. May we, may we grow more like you in holiness and righteousness. God, as we depart from iniquity and purify our hearts and lives through crucifying our flesh, Lord, we pray that we'll become vessels that will be honoring to you and that you'll use in a great way. God, we pray for our local church. May souls get saved, but God, may the saints of God have revival as we get our eyes focused on the things that, Lord, you're doing in this world. And God, we just ask, God, that you'll help our study of the devil's work to put in focus your work in this world. And that, God, we can be a part of it. I pray now. Thank you for Evan, his family. Bless him today. Help us just to uh, be an encouragement to him. Thank you for the refreshments that have been brought in, and we receive them with thanksgiving. I ask uh, God your hand to be on up our Bible school. May we have boys and girls that receive you as their Savior. And, Lord, we just trust God you'll give us a good, safe week that will glorify you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <laughs>